skip an edgy superintendent That's right. of the That's Air Force right. Academy. This is a room full of glass ceiling breakers, but I'm pretty sure, even if after we were reminded this morning of the incredible accomplishments here, that not many of us can really hold a candle to this number of ceilings. Um, the 19th superintendent of the Air Force Academy is the first woman ever to run one of the U.S. service academies. Thank you. You would have been one of the first women to attend the academy, a standout basketball star, the second highest all-time point scorer on the basketball team, the first woman to um, be the cadet wing commander, which is the senior um, cadet position at the academy, uh, the first female Rhodes Scholar from the academy, um, Brazenose College, which you attended, was all male for 500 years. <laughs> Find me a thicker ceiling than that. <laughs> um, Deputy Chief of Staff of Operations and Intelligence at NATO um, and now at the Air Force Academy. So that is a lot of traditionally male environment that you have navigated over the years. And so I'd love to start with uh, just hearing you talk a little about how you think that has shaped your leadership style. Well, thanks very much. It's a complete honor to be here. I think some of us remember the 70s, and uh, some good things came from the 70s, and one was President Ford signed legislation in 1975 that changed the status of women in the armed forces, and maybe you're not familiar with that, but women had been not in the same promotion scale. Certainly, women could not have families, and so if you met general, women generals uh, from the 60s and 70s, they would have been single because they couldn't have a family, and if you even married someone with a child, you had to get out. So. It was a very different time, uh, and they certainly could not go to the Federal Service Academies. Uh, thankfully, Parliament also changed Cecil Will's ro uh, will about the same time, so that kind of paved the way. So a lot of good things happened in the 70s. Uh, when I showed up at the Air Force Academy in 1977, I was in the second co-ed class, and there, there was a ceiling of 12% women there. So of the 1,500 cadets who came in, 150 of us uh, were women, and that's only 10%, obviously. Uh, but when I graduated, there were only 63 of us. So that was a pretty big attrition. And uh, what was just kind of shocking, I was in the second class, so we weren't really braced for impact. You know, the first class kind of expected the not very welcoming atmosphere. Officially, it was welcoming. Um, <laughs> but it's really shocking when you're a young person to, be, to come from 51% of the population and be told you're ruining things, you can't possibly do it. And what was a bit confusing to them is I could do it. And, uh, and so did many of my sisters could too. So, uh, so uh, I was very fit. I was a basketball player. I was, I was very fit and, uh, and it was pretty tough. But I think that was a shocking thing. It was a bit of a, it was a crucible, you know, and sometimes crucibles actually make you stronger and that's in, in metal and in people, I guess. So I think uh, feeling other for the first time in my life uh, really, help me cope later because we are, we're other for other reasons as you go along. I find, um, and I've been a bit of an eclectic uh, journeyer through the Air Force. I've done a lot of different things, uh, but a lot of us tend to forget that professional diversity counts too. And sometimes we say, well, you don't know what I do. You haven't done what I've done for 10 or 20 or 30 years, so you don't belong here. And that's actually in the last 10 years or so of my career as a general officer, I find myself being a bit of a generalist because I have some sense of how to organize people and things, and each time it's, I kind of harken back to that, that otherness feeling that, that actually helps me stay stronger, but also I think it helps me empathize better with my colleagues because I, I don't know everyone's journey, but I have some sense of what that feels like. Do you think that, we all talk, I think, a lot at our businesses about culture, and, um, and otherness is an interesting right. way into this conversation, but you now find yourself in charge of a very complicated culture, full of traditions, full of, of pressures that even other, other college and university presidents can't imagine. You somehow have to reconcile academic culture with military culture, and it's hard to imagine two that are more perhaps naturally in conflict times with each other. How have you, how do you shape culture, and how have you done that at the academy? Well, when I started out, I had some sense of where we were, that we had a lot of work to do, and it struck me that uh, I was the only one being asked about sexual assault and talking about it, or talking about uh, the lack of communication 
um, the stovepiping, and that can be really profoundly detrimental to an organization if people are willing, but their energy is all going in different directions and not aligned. So what I tried to do is get some unity of effort. It's a military term. And, uh, and balancing that in academia is different, right? Because we have a little bit of shared governance. Uh, I, we have a separate um, curriculum sort of function uh, that I take the advice of our professors on and our faculty. And I was on faculty 25 years ago, so I have a little bit of credibility there too. Um, but I found that our athletic department was sort of their own island. Um, the military training was, was separate and the faculty was going a different direction. So I've just been trying to align our efforts um, and have it be an alliance so that we're doing it together. And I have a great leadership team. We need to push the revolution out a little bit more. But I kind of started just by making sure we're on the same page. You know, in, in sports, when you get that feeling that we just want to win, then you don't really care if you take the shot or make the pass or hand out towels. You just, you'll do whatever it takes to win. And when you get that feeling, uh, whether it's sports or operationally, when I, I flew uh, transport and air refueling aircraft, and so when I was in my 20s, I flew around the world with a small crew with a cargo airplane in Africa and South America and the Middle East. It was a great uh, learning ground uh, of small team leadership. But you see that when people have the same vision, they can bring their talents then uh, to help you win in different ways. It's just sometimes they don't realize we're on the same, uh, same path. And so that's where I try to start with, with that. You, you mentioned the sexual assault scandal that you came in having to address right off the bat, you've replaced pretty much the entire athletic leadership at the academy. Can you talk a little bit first about what you have done to address the sexual assault problem? And then I'm curious about, as an athlete, do you have any ideas about why we keep encountering this, this connection between sexual assault and sports, whether at the professional or the, or the university level? Well. I would just say that sometimes these subcultures grow up and it's, uh, it's not necessarily premeditated. Uh, it happens and people aren't really don't realize what's happening. There were a lot of uh, survey information about the, the lack of communication, the lack of uh, focus in the athletic department. And uh, I kind of went over my athletic director and read the Riot Act, which is part of what I do too, I will confess. But I, I said, how do we... Um, how do we solve this? And they hadn't been made aware of what was happening. They really were unaware. It became such a subculture that they didn't know what was happening. So I did have a chance to hire a new athletic director. But more importantly, what I, I learned was we had 11 different helping agencies to help support victims of, of uh, not just sexual assault, but just to help people. But there were none in the athletic department. None of them answered to the superintendent. So I said, well then, here's an idea. What if they report to me and we have somebody in the athletic department attending to some of these things and explaining what the issue is? And I think that's one of the foremost things to explain what it is. It's not people hiding in the bushes, um, although there are some predators out there. Um, the bulk of the issues we have is one wanted sexual contact, and it's in that continuum that Katie Couric a little bit referred to last night when, you know, harass used to be two words. Um, or if you listen to the lyrics of Greece, which I can't do anymore when they come back from the summer and they're asking him how, what he did in the summer, and one of the lines is, did she put up a fight? And that was funny. Um, and so it's that sense of that, that it's unwanted contact. So I tell you, our cadets are great. I want you to be proud of the people who represent you in our Air Force. Um, we have uh, anonymous surveys every other year to say what the prevalence is that we think and we think it's around 3% of people maybe think they had sexual, uh, unwanted sexual contact. So it's a small number, uh, but any are bad, right? And we're held to a higher standard. We need to be uh, tremendous. And it's just uh, understanding what the issue is. That It's not okay to try to get to second base if the person doesn't want you to get to second base. That's a crime. And that's different. I think that's a different thing. So we've had to educate to say, what is it really? And our coaches need to understand that they're a part of this, that um, Men coaches talking to young men can help them grow. Uh, women coaches or men coaches talking to young women uh, about the boundaries of their body and how we respect each other in, in many ways. And one is just to have boundaries. Uh, so having that conversation has helped a lot. And just sometimes, I have to confess, a lot of our uh, students come in and they haven't had examples of healthy relationships. So we actually have actors come in. We, we don't do PowerPoint anymore. We, sit in small groups, speak in their language. It's a little rough. I sit in the shadows so they can't see me. Um, 
I went up to thank the actors one time and they started apologizing. I said, no, it's okay, you have to talk the way do, they do. But I, I think just that awareness right. and positiveness and then when we have Take Back the Night events, we had a huge one last April again. I had faculty come up and say, wow, you're really serious about this. We're on board, we wanna help. So when the faculty's on board and the coaches are on board and all the staff, then we can create a climate where when predators do act out, it really stands out. You can tell the difference. Whereas if it's blurred, if the lines are blurred, you, you, they may get away with it. They may hide in plain sight. So I think that's what's exciting right now is that we're getting a good vibe out there. We're on the same page, not just about that, but all the good things that we're trying to do to, to make this a modern experience. An experience started in 1802 you know, at West Point in a cloister uh, doesn't work now. So how do we deliver education? How do we deliver training and inspiration for people to go lead in a crazy asymmetric global network, joint coalition, you know, profession of arms that we're going into. Well, as for many of us, human capital is your greatest asset. Do you, do you feel as though the service academies in the military generally has, has adapted to the recruitment and talent retention and development needs of the 21st century military? And do you, what are you seeing, if anything, is changing in the motivations and the, the goals of the young people that you're seeing coming into, this, into the service? Well, just to, to, to let you know, our accessions model is the Electoral College. And that's, you know, we have that going for us. And um, <laughs> so everyone that has- that works so well. That's right. Everybody has to uh, be appointed by a member of Congress. Um, and so we have great geographic diversity, and I think that actually uh, came from the Civil War, my history department told me, because they found that hmm, a lot of West Point grads were on the southern side and there wasn't a lot of balance, and so maybe we should have this be a national sort of uh, resource. And so that's actually very difficult now. Only one half of 1% of Americans serve in uniform. Uh, I've been so amazed uh, these last couple of days of how knowledgeable this group is, and I'm grateful for that. But people are not, in general, aware of the military. We tend to be sort of lumped into one big group, and I have great respect for sailors and privates in the army and airmen in the air force but i'm not we need them but you need me too and so we need all these different uh levels of capabilities and so not people not many people really know about us especially on the east coast honestly it's uh people when i meet them they say oh that's cool do we have an air force academy yeah six, <laughs> 61 years yeah it's pretty good um, um but the uh so it's difficult to find them and i i think it's not part of uh, uh family habits, I don't think it will be healthy to have a separate military from the rest of society. I don't think that's what our democracy wants. But I do worry that we don't want it to become the family business. We have, uh, my accessions director, my admissions director assures me that we have less than 10% per year that are legacy with parents, but that adds up. And uh, so whether they went to our service academy or another one, there are a lot of connections. Um, the good news is when we reach out, we find some amazing gems and, you know, um, people who've never seen a silver spoon, you know, let alone have one in their mouth. And uh, I grew up in northwest Iowa and we, we, uh, not a military family, not a military family. My, my dad was a, a farmer and I told actually a, a, a very aristocratic four star British general one time my, my story and he just, he said, well, only in America. And I said, well, maybe, <laughs> maybe, but I think there is still an American dream out there and we have kids. We have kids who are homeless, and somebody counseled them at school, and, uh, and they have something else called grit. And there's a lot of scholarship right now, not just on standardized testing, but we're trying to broaden our aperture. To, if they have to be able to do the academic work, because we are a top five engineering school in the country, and we are in the top 25 liberal arts, believe it or not, and, uh, because we need the balance. We lead humans, so we need to know the human condition, but we need to be cognizant of technology. So if the kids can do the work, we have a prep school, uh, they can maybe spend a year to, to try to bring it up. Um, we have amazing immigrant stories of success to come be officers in the Air Force. And they don't have to be forever, but to serve for this amount of time, to open their aperture this way, and to give to something greater is pretty exciting. So we have, uh, we have amazing geographic diversity and we have amazing uh, talents in the cadets, but yet I still feel like people aren't quite aware of, of what we are. We're getting past the Vietnam um, um, hang over a bit. There are some, were some members of Congress who didn't want to have their constituents be cannon fodder. They remember, I'm sorry to make, it, to make a pejorative uh, statement, but that's what they kind of thought of us, and that's not necessarily the case, although we do lose comrades, and it's tragic um, too often. But 
but, uh, but people aren't really aware of what we do. They kind of see the movies. The generals are not portrayed as being really smart or honest in movies sometimes. It kind of bugs me when they do that. But, um, but I think people aren't as aware as I'd like them to be. I'm so frustrated because we're over time, but I want to ask just the last question. What's the, what's the best part of your job? You know, you meet, I, I tell you what, our 38th Rhodes Scholar, I was the 22nd Rhodes Scholar at the Air Force Academy, and our 38th is Rebecca Esselstein. And Rebecca's uh, from Ohio, and she was an astronautics major, and she was an academic All-American uh, of the year in the NCAA as a middle distance runner. And she's, I told you she's an astronautics major, and she was the number one in her class. And she's a wonderful person, and she's at Oxford right now. She's, she's on her way. And when I announced in front of her class that she was our top graduate, her classmates stood up and gave her a standing ovation because they respect her that much. So that's a pretty great feeling. It's a pretty great feeling. Thank, Thank you. you very Thank much. You